Hello, BookTube. I thought I'd give you one last comic book video for the year uh, because it's Wednesday and Wednesday was for a long time new comic book day here in the United States. Uh, it's not so much anymore because COVID-19 shut down lots of comic shops, all of them, and uh, eventually all of them. And quite a few of those shops were basically mom and pop organizations. They weren't able to stay shuttered without any kind of commerce. So they closed. They went out of business. They didn't just say, we'll do curbside pickup or we'll, we'll see you when this is all over. They went out of business. Uh, and also the comic book industry was rocked and roiled by change, of course. Their cha distribution chain was as vulnerable to disruption as anybody else's distribution chain. So who knows in 2021 what any of this will be like. There was also, uh, for one of the major two superhero comic books companies, there was a major merger and acquisition uh, by a parent company, AT&T, that, uh, that very very obviously has no interest in publishing superhero floppy comic books. 2021 may see a complete reshaping of the comic book landscape, but for now, at least one more video, Wednesday is new comic book day, and I wanted to give you a little update on all things comics in my world. I have not gone to a, a brick-and-mortar comic book store in a long time. In fact, the last time I darkened the doorstep of one, I was visiting Mark Richardson and his family up in Vermont and went into their Newbury Comics. Other than that, no, I have not gone to a comic shop at all. Uh, for the longest amount of time that I've ever gone without, while I haven't been traveling, while I've been living in this country, I've always managed to find a comic book shop and gone, no matter where I was living. But not so now. Not only when they were open, it seemed like too extraneous a risk, but now most of them are closed. Most of them are out of business. The chain that Mark goes to, Newbury Comics, is the same one that I tend to go to here in Boston. And also there is an independent comic book shop here called Comicopia that is also open. Its owner managed to, to weather the storm or is continuing to weather the storm. But I still don't go. They're, neither one is really part of my routine anymore. Uh, but I do manage to read comics, not only because uh, Mark and his wife very kindly sometimes send me comics, but also because some of you do, too. <laughs> and uh, 2020 also sees uh, out the phenomenon of Comicsgate, which has come up on my comic book videos many, many times. Uh, which has a bit of a long and convoluted history. I'll try to simplify it. Back in 2015 and 2016, uh, one particular person, Richard Meyer, uh, started to notice more and more two things in the Marvel comics that he was buying. He'd been a lifelong Marvel comics fan, loved them, went to new com on New Comic Book Day, no matter what day of the week that was, religiously, just like I did. And he started to notice two things right around then that... Uh, he at first ignored, and then he thought, no, this isn't just happenstance. This is a plan. One of them was a decrease in quality, where suddenly the scripts didn't look like they'd been edited, and especially the artwork wasn't as good, wasn't anywhere near as good. And I confess, but even when I didn't know about him at all, even when there was no comic skate long before then, I'd started to notice something of that myself, and I just put it down to a trough. Sometimes there's a trough period where neither Marvel nor DC, the two big superhero companies, really have all that much good talent. You just just have to wait it out, that's all. Uh, I could point to trough years like that in the past, where I bought the issues, but mainly for continuity's sake, rather than to enjoy the production. But the other thing that, that Meyer noticed was politics. That the that comic books, comic books have always been political. Obviously, if you're a fan of superhero comic books, you know that. They've always been political, but they've never been partisan at all. It, at the height of political furor in this country in 1968, in the late 1960s, even those diehard Marvel Comics fan wouldn't have had the first clue what Stan Lee's politics were, or what how Roy Thomas voted in the presidential election. Wouldn't have had the first clue. And the reason why is because not just because there was no social media, it's because Stan Lee, who was in charge of Marvel Comics at the time, would have instantly fired any writer who tried to make politics partisan. Because if you do that, you have to exclude part of your audience. And Stan Lee was all about including the whole of the audience. All he wanted was to sell comic books to people and get them enthused about the comics he was creating and masterminding and whatnot. But uh, 
as Meyer, and uh, there had been a few earlier blog commentators uh, who, who noticed the same thing as he noticed back then, suddenly the politics seemed partisan. Suddenly, uh, if you didn't have the same politics as the writer of the book, then you weren't just, uh, you know, let's agree to disagree, but rather you were the enemy. And that started to be reflected in the books. It started to be so that you couldn't even ignore it. It wasn't something that you saw in, you know, Amazing Heroes or online. It was something that was in the comics, so you couldn't ignore it, even if you wanted to. Uh, and he decided, Meyer decided to do something about that. So he started a YouTube channel called Diversity in Comics, in which he called out both things on a regular basis. Multiple videos a day. Kind of a freak makes multiple videos a day. <laughs> he made multiple videos a day. Uh, they had zero production quality, and most of them were shot with holding the camera at his eye level, looking down at the comic in his crotch. <laughs> and yet, the, the channel exploded. And I believe the reason why is because he tapped into a huge audience of tried-and-true traditional comic book fans who had noticed the same things and who were every bit as dissatisfied with them. And he made videos, video after video after video, and they were quite entertaining. He's, he's an amateur artist himself, and so he knows what he's looking at on the on a panel of comic book artwork. Although, even artists who weren't, all you needed was a little experience reading comic books to know, all right, well, this panel doesn't make any sense. This character is 50 feet away from this thing they're supposed to be right next to, or this anatomy is wrong. And the storyline as well is... is uh, weird, disjointed, the characters are uh, totally out of character, and there's no payoff, there's no arc, the, the, a lot of the characters are sh shrilly, stiffly self-righteous at the beginning of the arc, and they stay that way all through, they stay that way right to the end. Also, Meyer noticed that suddenly female superheroes were having an, an easy time of it. They would, they would encounter Doctor Doom or Galactus or something, beat him in one punch, and then pontificate for four panels. No hero's journey, no stakes, no good storytelling. Uh, and his channel took off and became noticed by the very comic book fans or pros that he was calling out by name. Uh, some of that name calling, some of that calling out by name was itself unprofessional. But at the time, in his own defense, I don't think he was really planning on becoming a comic book professional. That will feature in the story here. But uh, they hated it. Those, those pros hated it. And... A thing that would have been unthinkable in Stan Lee's day when he got, they got the bullpen got plenty of negative mail, some of it from yours truly. <laughs> they, what would have been unthinkable would have been to fight back. That's not what you do, or not what you should do. I know that's that's probably screaming into the void in a century that saw an author buy a plane ticket and go all the way to the doorstep of someone who left a negative review online in order to harass them, in order to plant a bomb. Now, it wasn't a bomb. It was a book. The point I'm trying to make is that it was a bomb. If you're unhinged enough to buy a plane ticket and fly across the country in order to track down and find the address of a person who left you a negative review in order to leave something on their doorstep, then your intent is to absolutely terrify them, even maybe terrorize them into moving. So it might as well have been a bomb. In a century like that, uh, it probably goes without saying that, of course, the pros would, would, would strike back. And they did. A lot. Uh, in extremely unbecoming ways. In extremely gross and sordid and unprofessional ways. And it started uh, a turf war. Uh, it started a, what, what its adherents call a consumer movement. Co that eventually became Comicsgate. Where these negative uh, creators, these unprofessional and, you know, in every sense of the word, not just how they behave towards fans, but how they produce their products. These unprofessional creators started to get called out. They started not to be considered anymore as protected under the giant corporate umbrella of Marvel Comics just in general. Instead, they were individual people who were doing a bad job. And Meyer pointed out at the same time that sales were cratering on some marquee books to where that should never happen. Now, I... I have always thought that the, the cratering of comic book sales is a lot more complex than just culture war. But I could be wrong. It could be that comics were always marginal enough in their fan base so that if you are on the wrong side of a culture war, that will crater your sales. Could very well be. But one way or another, the creators did not cover themselves in glory. They uh, resulted to uh, pornography. They 
they resulted to resorted to uh block botting their fans and and blockchaining their fans and whatnot and they, they uh they also were much more explicit in the interviews that they gave in the industry where they would come right out and say if you don't like my politics in other words my politics as i express them on twitter if you don't like my politics don't read my book and they weren't reined in by marvel comics or dc comics once the rot spread to dc they weren't reined in by their editors they weren't reined in by corporate uh even though the book they were talking about might be spider-man or the x-men or uh this weird this weird homunculus carol danvers as as captain marvel that that marvel comics decided was going to be their flagship character marvel Dan carol danvers as Ms. Marvel, then Quasar, then Warbird, then Captain Marvel. This uh, a, a extremely uh, boring th third-tier character who was occasionally made interesting when she was part of the Avengers, but not otherwise. Uh, but it, it wasn't just her. If it had been just relegated to, to uh, pocket comics like that, maybe it wouldn't have been quite so bad. But Spider-Man is not your book. <laughs> is the thing that I always wanted to tell these creators when I was watching their antics. I always wanted to say... Captain America, Spider-Man, the Avengers, these aren't your book. You're a, core, you're a caretaker. And a lot of the people that you're slagging off as neo-Nazis and white supremacists on social media were reading and loving that book long before you came to it. In some cases, before you were born. So they're not the people that you... They're, they're the, the loyal customers. And for you to be so entitled and proprietary is to say, well, if you don't like my politics, then don't read my book. And my book happens to be Spider-Man. And not get called for it by your superiors. Stan Lee, even a hippie like Roy Thomas, would have had you in his office in a nanosecond. And said, I'm going to overlook this this one time. If you ever do anything like it again, you're fired. I'll make sure you never work in the industry again. And oh, by the way, the first thing I want you to do when you get back to your desk is cancel your social media accounts. That would have been the first thing that even Roy Thomas would have done. But instead, nothing happened at Marvel Comics and then at DC Comics. Instead, writers got to say that. Even to vocal and sometimes raw fans, they got to say, if you don't like my politics, don't buy my book. It's not for you. Um, and that went on. And the, the longer it went on, the more uh, Myers' channel became popular. And the more a refrain started cropping up in the ranks of those so-called professionals. They started saying, it's easy for you to carp from the peanut gallery. Try putting a book of your own in stores and see how easy it is. We bet that if you put a book in stores, it would fail massively. So you're no one to criticize us. Now, of course, speaking as a professional book critic, that is a line, a line of hogwash. No one needs credentials. to, to It doesn't require credentials to offer a legitimate criticism. Right? <laughs> right? If you are... I, I always go back to cars because I don't drive them. But if you were driving your car down a hill and you notice that the brakes really weren't working all that well, they are more of a suggestion than a, physic, a physics action, and that you got to the bottom of the hill, pushed the thing to the nearest uh, mechanic, and said, the brakes are wrong with this. The mechanic will not say to you, well, I don't see your mechanic certificate. <laughs> no, no, you don't need qualifications to criticize something. But nevertheless, that's what the pros said to Meyer. They said, you know, among other things, among unprintable things, they said, Try it yourself. It's so, you make it sound so easy. Try it yourself. And he did. He crowdfunded a comic book. Uh, and it did really, really well. It made a huge amount of money. And it came to the attention of a small publisher, Antarctic Press, who has comic books that show up at Newbury Comics. They offered him a deal. And a comic professional, Mark Wade, the author of Kingdom Come, the author of, uh, of a couple of graphic novels that I actually have here at Hyde Cottage, uh, who had been a vociferous critic of Meyer and Meyer of him, apparently contacted Antarctic Press. It said, I, I'm not sure you know who you're dealing with here. Allow me to tell you who you're dealing with here. Now, when the details are all murky. Of course, if Wade did that, it's illegal. You can't, you can't muck around so much business like that. There are laws against that. The specific law, as the ranks of Comicsgate were to learn, is tortious interference. You're not, it's against the law to do that. But Wade went further. At public videotaped conventions and gatherings, he just routinely started referring to Meyer as a white supremacist. Which is slander. <laughs> that is that is defamation. That that's 
also illegal. <laughs> and, and it doesn't matter that Meyer rather self-evidently isn't. I mean, he has he has uh, multiracial children. It, it doesn't it doesn't so much matter. It matters what you say, and that is a hard thing to wipe off. I'd be willing to bet I didn't do it before this video, but I'm willing to bet that if I Googled Richard Meyer. That would be in the top five, or maybe the first thing that came up. And he knew that at the time. It made him furious. So he sued Mark Waid for both those things, tortious interference and defamation. Uh, he made a lot of money from his indie comic, from his from his uh, crowdfunded indie comic. And he ha therefore, he had a war chest. Wade is a wealthy man. And he had a war chest to take him to court. And uh, Comicsgate watched <laughs> that lawsuit with avid intentions <laughs> they, because they knew what i've mentioned before when i brought it up on this channel which is that uh if it got to trial which is richard Meyer kept saying over and over again in videos this i'm not going to back down this is going to get to trial and he's going to lose comicsgate realized that if mark wade arguably one of the biggest names in mainstream comics actually did go to trial for calling comicsgater a, a white supremacist and for interfering in his business that if he lost at trial, that would be a huge, huge victory for the movement of Comicsgate, what had become uh, so fairly institutionalized as Comicsgate. Uh, Wade acted like a guilty man. I think he had a stronger case than Comicsgate tends to think. Uh, number one, that Antarctic Press made a public statement saying there was no pressure, that, that, Wade, that Wade is innocent. It's pretty tough <laughs> to get that part of your lawsuit off the ground if the people you're claiming were interfered with say there was no interference. Uh, then you have to sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink at the jury and say, well, of course that's what they'd say. <laughs> the, the defamation thing, much stronger. Wade was on much thinner ground there because there was evidence. Direct videotape and audio evidence of, of, some, of him breaking the law. But he acted like a guilty man. He litigated. An old friend of mine used to say, lawyers argue and liars litigate. And he litigated. He got um, stupid motion after stupid motion floated. He got delays, all kinds of them, in what quickly became apparent was an attempt to simply outspend Meyer, to just make him quit because it was too expensive, and because he planned on dragging it on forever. Uh, also didn't help that one of Wade's lawyers, Mark Zaid, was a lawyer in the, the Russia investigation of Donald Trump. That too many comic skaters, way too many comic skaters, who are generally smart people, way too many of them just reflexively referring to that as the Russia hoax. When it wasn't. It wasn't a hoax. It wasn't at all. If, if you don't believe, the Mueller report is a public document with barely any redaction. Just read it and see if you don't see blatantly illegal action and open collusion on the part of the American president with the Russians. But nevertheless, uh, one way or another, uh, the court case just dragged on and on and on. And the, the thing that made it important here is that Meyer was raising money for it. Every video. He made at least two or three videos a day. Every video ended with, you know, I've got a GoFundMe going for this lawsuit. Feel free to contribute to it to fight back against the forces of cancel culture in comics. And a lot of people did that. A lot of people with very little money contributed to that fund. Because they were never going to get a better chance. Because the only other comic skater had anywhere near enough money uh, to, to take a professional to court is Ethan Van Skyver, who is never willingly going to set foot inside a courtroom where he is open to discovery and deposition. Not in a million years. So the, the ranks of comic skate sort of closed behind Meyer. They thought, this is our chance. Uh, and the big comic skate news to round out 2020 is that Meyer withdrew the suit. This is, this is just recently uh, already Twitter and especially YouTube is already howling with videos and bleats of outrage that he did in fact quit. That this was just, he withdrew the suit and he and Mark Wade uh, issued a joint statement that they were going their separate ways. They're just going to let it go. And that neither one, uh, with a nod towards one of the biggest things that happens in American jurisprudence, which is bragging rights, the nod in the in the statement was that neither one has the right to brag that they won. Now, that isn't necessarily going to stop either one of them from bragging that they won, <laughs> because what's going to happen if they do? Neither one's going to resume the lawsuit, and both of them know that. So Meyer could make a video tomorrow saying, well, yeah, I withdrew the suit because he begged me to. 
and uh, Mark Waite, I guarantee you, has already started dining out on saying, yeah, he withdrew the suit because he knew he'd lose. One way or another, uh, the ranks of Comics Gate assembled today are in sackcloth and ashes because they view this, I think rightly, as a major defeat for themselves. It looks like an amicable parting of ways that's completely neutral. But the, the goal here all along was not to quit. The goal was to keep going and to hold Mark Wade accountable for his abominable behavior. Uh, and that isn't going to happen. And it's, it's not Mark Wade who asked for the suit to be withdrawn. It, it, of course he couldn't. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was Meyer who, who made the, the suit and it, he was the one who asked to withdraw it. So that's all over with now. And who knows what the fate of Comicsgate is after this. Quite a few uh, comic skaters on, on Twitter were saying the comic skate is dead after this, that the, the bad guys win. Uh, the odd and sad thing about the whole thing is that it, it isn't probably going to make all that much difference. DC Comics, for instance, the publisher of real superhero comics like Superman and Wonder Woman and the Justice League and my beloved Legion of Superheroes, announced a massive trimming back of their line of comics. A massive. I mean, by two-thirds. Marvel has a huge amount of cinema money, but will probably do likewise. And the, the people who will be left producing those little scraps will be the enemies of Comicsgate. They won't be traditional artists at all, I don't think. Uh, I think the traditional artists, the people that Comicsgate and I loved over the decades, will move on elsewhere. Comics will probably mutate in 2021 into something that's far more boutique, far more one-shotty, far, far more expensive, but far less prolific. And the monthly comics will be sort of an abandoned battlefield, so none of this will matter. It, it, it'll be interesting to see how it turns out. Uh, so that's your your comic skate update. But I also wanted to give you comics updates. The comics that I've been reading. Now, one of them, I've got it here on my lap, and I have to tell you, my legs are asleep because it's so heavy. It's this... <laughs> it's the five years later saga of my beloved Legion of Superheroes. Look at the size of this thing. One of you sent this to me as a present for Christmas. Isn't that incredible? Uh, and this is uh, the story of uh, the Legion of Superheroes, a band of teenage superheroes a thousand years in the future. I'm going to set this on the floor <laughs> with a thud. Uh, only they, instead of being a thousand years in the future, they're a thousand years plus five. And in that five years, the universe has gone to heck. And the Legion has been disbanded in disgrace. And some of its members have been arrested. They've scattered to the winds when suddenly a handful of them decide to re- to get the band back together, to reform the Legion, because the galaxy still needs heroes. Uh, I read these issues when they first came out, and more and more loved them with every issue, and uh, waited just impatiently, like all Legion fans did, for it to be collected. And now it finally has been. I'm, I'm going through this volume uh, one issue at a time in loving detail. This will be a reread for the ages. Uh, but there is something else, also a gift uh, from one of you. I noticed, I mentioned... But in 2020, I've done a lot of e-reading. I've switched over to a lot of e-reading. And one of the fringe benefits of that has been finding how generous a lot of you whiz kids are. <laughs> Not all of you, but a handful, half a dozen whiz kids have been sending me their electronic libraries. And it's been so much fun. So nice to, to meet such generous people. And recently, one of you sent me a run on Marvel Comics by one of the villains of, of Comicscape, by Dan, the writer Dan Slott who blocked fans on social media with such wild abandon that the fans actually nicknamed him <laughs> Slotto Blocktavius. <laughs> Referring to Otto Octavius, Dr. Octopus. Uh, a great Spider-Man villain uh, played by Alfred Molina in one of the only good Spider-Man movies. Uh, and I guess Molina is going to reprise his role in the next Spider-Man movie as Dr. Octopus. Uh, uh, Dr. Octopus always struck me as kind of weird as a Spider-Man villain. He's this sort of pudgy, thickly bespeckled mad scientist who develops a pair, a, a, a brace, a mechanical brace of, of metal arms that are super powered. The arms are incredibly strong and they respond to his will. And he puts the, he puts the brace around his, his pudgy midsection and then he has octopus arms. And he can use them to climb the walls of buildings or rip open bank vaults or whatever, and eventually to fight Spider-Man. But the thing that always bothers me about, about Dr. Octopus is that if Spider-Man gets inside the guard of his arms, which Spider-Man regularly does, and punches him just once, Spider-Man can lift a car over his head. He can lift, he can lift 10 tons over his head. 
So if if somebody can lift ten tons over his head, punches you in the jaw, the the fight's not going to continue raging over the rooftops of Brooklyn. You're going to be dead. Or if he pulls the punch, you're going to be comatose for a year. That should have been the end of Dr. Octopus the very first time that happened. Instead, it just keeps going on and on where Spider-Man can pound the daylights out of him. No writer ever addressed that. No writer ever said some feedback of the mechanical arms actually enhances his physical durability. That would have been easy to do. No writer, as far as I know, ever did that. Instead, it was just it was just this incredibly superpowered teenager pounding away on a guy who looked and acted and sounded like a substitute science teacher. <laughs> uh, and years ago, right before Comicsgate really ignited, Dan Slott had a fantastic idea. I was skeptical about it at first. He posited a, an Otto Octavius who, after years of being pounded on by a super by a superpowered teenager, was dying. His body was failing completely. He had been through one too many battles. He still had the mechanical arms, but he, his body was going to die. And he comes up with one last master plan, which is to swap minds with Spider-Man. So that the body of uh, Spider-Man is in the dying body of Otto Octavius, dies and is gone, and Otto Octavius gets to live as superpowered and young Spider-Man. And at the climax of, uh, I think it was Spider-Man number 700, he actually succeeds. And Peter Parker finds himself trapped inside this body that then promptly dies. But what Otto Octavius didn't anticipate is that when he got Peter Parker's, when, when he entered into Peter Parker's brain, he would get Peter Parker's moral sensibility. That he wouldn't just get great power, he would also get great responsibility. And suddenly he becomes a different Otto Octavius, but not completely different. He suddenly doesn't want to hurt people or rob banks or do evil. But he's still uh, arrogant and condescending and superior. And that's what he rebrands himself as. Not the amazing Spider-Man, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, but as the superior Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, and he starts to take over. Spider-Man's role. He starts to increase, uh, update the equipment, become much more systematic, and uh, much more savage towards the not the nuisance villains that Spider-Man tended to fight and then web from the lampposts for the police. Everybody starts to notice a difference. Everybody starts to notice that Spider-Man is suddenly saying bah and preposterous. <laughs> Spider-Man is suddenly talking like Otto Octavius. No one puts the two of them together because they assume Dr. Octopus is dead. Uh, and it was, I, I was amazed that, at how well the story works. I loved it. Just loved it. One of you sent me the electronic version of the whole saga of the Superior Spider-Man. So I've been reading that and just love it. It has great artwork. Umberto Ramos is fantastic in this. But, but in addition to that, uh, I've been loving the story. Just, just loving the story. You know how it's going to turn out. You know how it's going to turn out. You know that, that Peter Parker is eventually going to take up residence in his own body again. It's never, it's never going to be permanent. Unlike, for instance, the damage that was done to Captain America when he was revealed, so, so to speak, as a Nazi, as a Hydra agent. That damage is person, permanent. That The Captain America, who is no longer a Hydra agent, is actually not Captain America. That continuity, the continuity of that character was rewritten and has stayed rewritten. Done only to make Comicsgate howl with outrage. That's the only reason that plot happened. And so much else that these comic professionals have done over the last four years has been done solely to make this group of offended fans more offended. I'll talk about unprofessional. <laughs> but the, uh, the Superior Spider-Man happened before a lot of that. And it's tremendously good fun. Just tremendous. I remember buying the issues and thinking, well, okay, I didn't think that uh, this had the dramatic potential to go on. Uh, which is why Marvel Comics pays you, Dan Slott, a King's Ransom, and why they don't pay me. Because you did see the potential here. I just thought it was incredible. Watching Otto Octavius reconnect with his humanity. Sitting as Peter Parker at the table with Aunt May and, and, and feeling loved for the first time ever in his life. Meeting some of the victims of the crime sprees of Dr. Octopus and swearing to do right by them. And doing right by them and feeling how great it feels to do right instead of wrong. As a hero arc, it was captivating. Absolutely captivating. If I thought that Dan Slott was lobbying the, the editors at Marvel Comics to make this permanent, I would have hated it. But as a long, self-contained and very good story arc that explores the nature of good versus evil and villains and heroes, I loved it. 
So it was inspired. I, I can't thank you enough. The, the one of you who sent this, I can't thank you enough for sending it. I've been ha having a great time rereading it. And that's how I'm going out on 2020. So that's, that's how we're going to wrap up 2020 comics-wise with what can only be perceived as a major defeat for Comicsgate. Uh, and with two great rereading experiences, Legion five years later, uh, which is even better than I thought. And uh, although I'm not sure how the later issues will hold up, we'll have to see about that. Uh, and the Superior Spider-Man, which I'm loving even more the second time than I did the first time. So that's that's my comic book update for you. Of course, there were new comics today, and I was notified by both of those comics, Newbury Comics and Comicopia here in Boston. I was notified by both of them that they're open for business all day, and that they have this week's shipment of new comics. I just didn't go. I just didn't go. I should. I should change that and, and start going back. Uh, I'll. I I don't know. <laughs> well, if I'm back in 2021. Uh, I always say when it comes to these things that I, the re main reason I don't go is because these things aren't on my route. I need, I want, I like to group multiple things so that I'm not just making one trip and one trip back. But it would, it would be possible, I think, to group together a bunch of things that I want to do on a regular basis in a convenient loop. It wouldn't be the same loop as before, but I think I could do that. So if I'm back, we'll explore it. <laughs> in the meantime, that's your last comic book update of 2020, the year that I think future historians will say ended mainstream four-color superhero comics as they had previously been known. And not all of that is COVID. As the forces of Comicsgate were saying a year ago, or back in March and April, they were saying back in March and April, the people who are destroying this industry are going to try to rewrite history. They're going to say, well, yes, sales tanked, but because of COVID. And the forces of Comicsgate, Meyer and a bunch of other people said, don't let them do that. Remember that the whole thing was falling apart long before COVID. It was falling apart because of their behavior, because of them alienating the key core audience that buys their books. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how those, those uh, histories will be written. My antenna were alerted the other day to the fact that someone is pitching around uh, to mainstream publishers uh, a history of this whole thing, uh, a book about Comicsgate and, and the fate of American comics. I don't know the author, but I know some of the people they're pitching the book to, and if they get a yes, if they get a green light, then 2022 we'll see uh, the first major history of this stuff, and we'll see how it comes out. Uh, but one way or another, that's enough about comic books, so I'm going to wrap this up, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.